everyone. In this video, I would like to share with you four false teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, if you're a Christian, you probably know what you believe in and what you don't believe in. But why specifically would you say that I am a Christian and not a Jehovah's Witness? Is it just the way that you've been brought up? Or is it specifically because you understand what they believe in and you reject several of their beliefs based on the authority of Scripture? Today, I want to help you understand their beliefs and what the Bible really teaches so that you're always prepared to give an answer to the hope that you have within you. Find out today here on That Scripture Life. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the notification bell. The link will be in the comments if you're on Facebook or Instagram. Now the first false teaching is this, a rejection of Jesus as Yahweh or Jehovah God. JW.org states this, we follow the teachings and examples of Jesus Christ and honor him as our savior and as the son of God. However, we have learned from the Bible that Jesus is not Almighty God and that there is no scriptural basis for the Trinity doctrine. So the Jehovah's Witnesses do not reject that Jesus is a deity. That's not the issue at hand. What they believe is that Jesus is a God, not the one God, one with the Father as John 10.30 declares, but instead that he's, he's more of a copy of the Jehovah God and is therefore a lesser God than he is. But this is not what the New Testament authors believed about Jesus. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they quoted the Old Testament and applied several passages to the person of Jesus Christ. For example, in a verse that we can all agree can only refer to Jehovah God, Psalm 102.25 says this, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. So get this. Thousands of years later, the author of Hebrews quotes this verse and applies it to Jesus in Hebrews 1.10, where it says this, And you, Lord, lay the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. And so you see, the New Testament authors do this consistently, time and time again. In the Carmen Christi, we see Paul quote these astounding words about Christ at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But you see, this isn't just something that Paul just made up and he wasn't just quoting a popular hymn of the day. He's quoting an Old Testament passage about Yahweh and applying that to the person of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 45, 22b-23 says this, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow and every tongue swear allegiance. The list can go on and on, but the point is this. The New Testament authors, guided by the Holy Spirit, repeatedly took passages that refer to Yahweh and applied them to Jesus Christ, so it is irrefutable. Jesus is not a lesser God than Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. Now, second false teaching, a rejection of the doctrine of the Trinity. So. Naturally, as a result of their rejection of Jesus as Jehovah God, the Jehovah's Witnesses also deny the existence of the Trinity. They believe that Jesus is a lesser God created by Jehovah, and therefore that the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force used by Jehovah God. But here's the truth from Scripture. God the Father is referred to as Yahweh. Jesus is referred to as Yahweh. And we also see that the Holy Spirit is referred to as Yahweh. Look at what the Apostle Peter had to say about the composition of the books of the Bible. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So you see, the Apostle Peter attributes every prophecy and word of the Old and New Testaments to the Holy Spirit. And now look at who the Old Testament prophets attributed their writings to. This, the word of the Lord, Yahweh to Zerubbabel, Zechariah 4, 6. Then again, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, Haggai 1, 1. And again, 
the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah 1, 4. So the prophets are saying, this word that we're speaking, it's not from us, it's from Yahweh. And then we see the apostle Peter saying that all the prophets spoke by the Holy Spirit. In other words, in the apostle's mind, there is no difference between the Holy Spirit and Yahweh. The clear teaching of scripture is that the Holy Spirit is Yahweh, Jesus is Yahweh, the Father is Yahweh. Now this is a topic for a whole other video, but while these three persons are not the same person, in other words, Jesus is not the Father, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, but what we see in scripture is that all three persons are called Yahweh or Jehovah God, to put it in the Jehovah's Witnesses terms, they're called Yahweh while at the same time declaring that there is only one God. This is why we Christians uphold the doctrine of the Trinity. And false teaching number three, a false interpretation of the 144,000 in Revelation. JW.org says this, Jehovah God, Jesus Christ, and the faithful angels reside in the spirit realm. And get this, a relatively small number of people, 144,000, will be resurrected to life in heaven to rule with Jesus in the kingdom. So the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that only 144,000 persons will be in heaven with Jesus while everyone else who is saved will reign on a paradise on earth. And they even take it a step further and say that only those 144,000 are benefactors of the new covenant and only they have the heavenly hope while all other Jehovah's Witnesses are excluded from the new covenant and only have an earthly hope. Now this idea that the new covenant was only made with 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses is in complete contradiction of passages like Genesis 15:5, which tells us that the number of people who will be saved under the terms of the new covenant are too many to count. It says, and he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And then again in Revelation, after this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. So scripture actually teaches us that the number of redeemed people in heaven will be countless, as many as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand in the sea, in contrast to the teaching of the Jehovah's Witnesses who have it set as a fixed number. So the question is, who are the 144,000 in reality? Now I'll be honest, the answer varies even in Orthodox Christianity, depending on your view of the book of Revelation, if you're a historicist, a futurist, a partial preterist, and that's a topic for a whole other video, but I will say this, as a partial preterist myself, who believes that the vast majority of Revelation was fulfilled prior to the year 70 when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, we would say on scriptural grounds that the 144,000 are a symbolic number representing the amount of Jews that escaped death when Jerusalem was attacked in the year 70. And the fourth false teaching, a rejection of the eternality of hell. J.W. Org says this, people who die pass out of existence. They do not suffer in a fiery hell of torment. God will bring billions back from death by means of a resurrection. However, those who refuse to learn God's ways after being raised to life will be destroyed forever with no hope of a resurrection. So in other words, to the Jehovah's Witness, hell doesn't last forever. Unbelievers are simply annihilated. They're erased from existence, never to live again in any kind of way. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this can sound kind of good to some of us. Now, why is that? It's because we have a hard time understanding how God could torment a human being in hell for all of eternity. It sounds more merciful to just zap them out of existence than continue to live in such a miserable state. This is simply not what the Bible teaches about hell. He also will drink the wine of God's wrath 
poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So friends, there is nothing more terrifying than the reality of the eternality of hell. A proper and biblical understanding of this doctrine should help Christians both appreciate what Christ has done for us, saving us from its flames, and should put an urgency in our hearts to preach the gospel to all, at all times, that all God's people should be saved from the wrath to come. So how can we use these truths to live that scripture life? Number one, study the scriptures to give a reason for the hope you have. You see, it's not enough to say, I believe in the Trinity because that's all I've ever known, or that's what makes most sense for me. No, be ready to show in scripture why you believe anything at all about Christianity. You cannot separate your walk with Jesus from your knowledge of the scriptures. Oh, well, that's just how I've experienced God in my own life. But guess what? The Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Muslims, they claim to have experienced God in their own lives too. So who's right and who's wrong? You might reject the teaching that Jesus is a copy of Jehovah God. Great, so do I. But on what basis do you reject it? If you don't have the authority of scripture to back up what you believe, then everything is negotiable, nothing is certain, and we have no right to tell anyone about a God-man named Jesus of Nazareth who came to save a people from the penalty of their sins. So friend, be a student of the scriptures so that you may rightfully separate truth from error, cults from the faith, and so that you have the confidence that what you believe really is the truth breathed out by God. And so what are your thoughts on the Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs and what scriptures give you the confidence of what you believe? Please leave me a respectful comment here below. I would love to hear your thoughts. And all right, friends, if you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and share it with your friends. I'll see you all on the next video. Grace and peace.